Thank you very much, Richard, and it's a great pleasure to be here today. So I'm going to be talking to you about the National Portrait Gallery and the renovation project and how we have revisited the way we approach the collection. I thought I would start off just by saying a little bit about the history of the National Portrait Gallery for those of you who are not familiar with it. But we were established in 1856, so that's a long time ago in the mid-Victorian era. Our founding fathers were sort of three men. The first one was a man called Philip Henry Stanhope, who was an amateur historian, but also an MP. And he came up with the idea and he petitioned Parliament for the idea of a gallery of British worthies, the most eminent people in British history. And in that he was supported by Thomas Carlyle, the biographer, who came up with this famous statement about a portrait. He said, a portrait is a small lighted candle by which to read a biography. So he felt portraits could tell you more about someone's life than a whole written biography, which is quite an interesting idea. And then there was Thomas Macaulay, the historian as well. And if you go to the MPG, I'll show you here. There are busts on those three rambles at the entrance to the building. So when the gallery was established, there were certain sort of rules um, for admission to the collection. And these were quite important because it's what makes the National Portrait diff Gallery different from any other gallery in this country. First of all, it's the sitter is more important than the artist. So you, you're considered for admission given the impact you've had on British culture and society. The merit of the portrait was a secondary consideration. And this explains why we have some terrible portraits in the collection. <laughs> I'm not being, you know, I think you think of the portrait by Brownwell Bronte of the sisters, for example, it's in terrible condition, it's an amateurish portrait, but it has this cult status because it's the only portrait of the Brontes. The portrait of Shakespeare, that was the first work to enter the collection. That's also by an artist. It's attributed to a man called John Taylor. We don't know if it's by him or not. It's not a brilliant portrait, but again, it has this incredible aura around it because it's probably the only portrait of Shakespeare made during the playwright's um, lifetime. So the aesthetic quality of the picture, secondary importance. The other key factor was that at that particular time, the 19th century, they overlooked, the trustees overlooked human fallibility. So you could be a bad person, um, someone could be canceled today and you could still be included. So the idea was you would forgive great faults and errors. So that's quite interesting, bearing in mind today that we tend to sort of judge people quite sort of morally at that time. They didn't. So you could say they were perhaps more open minded then than we are now. That's quite an interesting matter to consider. So those were the main rules. The other one was this incredible, which Richard will remember, the 10 year rule. It's a bit like you know having a blue plaque. You had to be dead for ten years before you were considered worthy of admission. The idea you had to you know, prove the test of um, time, unless you were the reigning monarch. So only the reigning monarch could be admitted. They were alive. All those rules were overturned in 1969. That's when Roy Strong became director, and of course when Richard was working at the MPG. That's when that rule was abolished and we started collecting photographs for the first time. Now photographs make up 68% of the MPG collection. So that has really grown exponentially since that particular time. So that's when 10 year rule was abolished. We started collecting living sitters and starting collecting photographs. And the numbers of work entering the collection really increased dramatically. Today, if we consider the entire collection that includes the primary collection of paintings, sculptures, you know, vintage prints, drawings, um, the photographs collection, the reference collection that we have about just under 400,000 works. So it's a lot of works in the um, collection. So um, very dis distinct from, if you say, the Tate or the National Gallery next door. Um, 
So I think we have to remember what is unique about the MPG. As for its home, the building, well, when we opened in 1856, we were not in Trafalgar Square. We were actually in a townhouse in Great George Street, where the first curator of the gallery, an extraordinary man called George Scharf, he lived there with his mother and sister. And every single room of the house was hung floor to ceiling with um, portraits. It soon outgrew the premises and then moved to South Kensington into a wooden building, which was adjacent to the um, India Museum collection. That caught fire, the India Museum caught fire in 1885. So the collection was moved to Bethnal Green, to what is now the Bethnal Green Museum of Childhood or Young VNA, as it's just been rebranded. And then in the 1890s, a benefactor called William Alexander came forth and said, I will give you the funds to build a gallery. Um, and the site was found on the old sort of New St. Martin's workhouse, which wraps around the National Gallery. So the slide you see here at the top, this is not working, so I'll point it out. This building here is the um, MPG as it opened in um, St. Martin's place. Um, and you can see there um, the building very much as we know it today. It's um, designed by a man called Ewan Christian, who was a really interesting architect. It's a sort of an amalgamation of the National Gallery facade, but also based on a church in Bologna, the entrance. And on the north side, it was based on um, a wonderful palace in Florence, the Palazzo Medici Riccardi. Um, so it's an amalgamation. It's, it was really created in this sort of you know, Italian palazzo um, um, style. Beautiful um, building. But at that time, the main entrance was facing the east, looking on to St. Martin's in the field, because to the north, you had the notorious Soho area. And William Alexander did not want visitors being tainted by sort of you know, low types. So it faced um, east. Now, I mention this because as the gallery has grown, over the, um, the years, you can see the po problems that developed. So to begin with, in the 1890s, there wasn't much traffic, so you could get into the gallery quite easily. This sort of horrible photograph here was taken in the early years of um, this century. You can see the traffic. It rather sort of obscures the facade of the building, which is also looking very discolored by that time. And then the other problem was congestion, because the gallery became very successful with its temporary exhibition programme. People would come to the gallery um, in large numbers. And in fact, um, from between 2002 and 2012, I think you know, um, visitor numbers increased about 2 million a year. And this created quite a few congestion problems with that east entrance. And you can see the revolving doors. People often got trapped or caught in the revolving on um, doors. There'd be long queues to get into the um, exhibitions, into the galleries, down into the learning centre as well, which of course was a horrible, musty um, place. So you know, for many, many years, you know, we, the trustees did say, you know, the executive team, we really do need to develop this gallery to make it fit for the 21st century, hence the Inspiring People renovation project. Now, there are a lot of problems with the displays as well, um, because, as I mentioned earlier on, the MPG is a gallery about British history, culture, society, biography. The interpretation is really important for our visitors. Our visitors like to read the labels, the information to learn about the personages on display. So we have labels, but we also had others of devices to really um, help visitors as they explored the collection. One of which was this marvelous thing called the Portrait Explorer, which you see this lady looking at. This was um, sort of installed, I think in the late nineties and it was state of the art at the time. But by the time you get to sort of 2015, it was looking a little bit old fashioned and some of the galleries which people thought they had dated a bit as well. This is the Duveen Wing, which was funded by Joseph Duveen in the 1930s. It was sort of you know, refurbished in about 2002 in an art deco style with this sort of silver coving and peppermint green wall. Some people thought it looked a little bit, um, a lot of people didn't like it and they didn't like the metallic furniture, which was quite dangerous as well. The slide in the middle is on the floor below. These are the Victorian galleries. 
And this is a um, photograph of what we call the Statesman's Gallery. These galleries were refurbished in 1998. And the Statesman's Gallery is a sort of long corridor of British statesmen in the 19th century and their busts. And a lot of visitors slightly objected to this. They felt it was a bit pale, male and stale. And it wasn't sort of diverse or inclusive or um, enough. And, um, and that people felt that gray was rather depressing as well. And the other thing just to point out about these galleries, when they were sort of new, um, we put it out, it was really rather beautiful. I think the Statesman's Gallery is rather beautiful on um, room, particularly when we have evening events. It was all lit up. It looked rather wonderful. But it was rather sort of gloomy. And I think the gloomy effect was because of these shutters on the windows, these sort of teak shutters cut out the light and gave it this sort of cave-like um, feel to try, try and create the feeling of, say, the Palace of Westminster. But a lot of people were put off by that. So when we came to think about the displays, um, we did a lot of research into sort of previous iterations. And one thing we actually alighted upon was um, Roy Strong's rehang of the collection in the 1960s, because some um, the, re the recent display had just really been chronological according to biography, but the idea was to perhaps make it a bit more, um, in to, to really help audiences engage with the works, we should make the displays more thematic. So we started to look back to Roy Strong's rehang. This is a shot from the 1960s. I don't know if Richard, you remember this room. This is the Civil War Gallery, um, where it really shows the main players and the main battles. Um, of the Civil War and also bringing in associated objects such as armour. But you will see that the paintings, the portraits, are really treated like interpretation devices. So we didn't want to go back to that. We thought that was just going too far the other way, the other extreme. But we were quite interested in the idea of having different layers of interpretation. So a lot of research took place in the early years of our application to the National Heritage Lottery Fund for funding about how we might actually look at the rehang of the collection. Just to say a bit more about the gallery, this, this is some shot of the East Wing. Now, the East Wing is that part of the building which adjoins the National Gallery on the east side. Now, this used to be part of the MPG when we first um, opened in St. Martin's Place. They were exhibition galleries. Downstairs, there was a sculpture gallery. But um, during the course of its history, we actually sort of, um, it went, we sold it to the National Gallery next door because they wanted to expand their 19th century galleries. Behind this um, wall is the big whistle jacket portrait by um, Stubbs. But little did they know that George Schaff, who was a very sort of um, cunning man, our first director, he designed these galleries, the four level, to be at a different height, different level from the National Gallery next door. So when the National Gallery discovered this, they realized it was gonna to be too expensive for them to knock through. So they leased the East Wing back to us and we used it as office space. And it was a horrible area. It was all full of asbestos divisions. It smelt horrible, um, hadn't really changed much since the sort of you new know, um, 70s. It was used by our publishing team, not a very attractive um, place. So we brought it back from the National Gallery and the idea was to turn it back into galleries as you and Christian originally intended these spaces to be. And this is just um, when it, the whole place was stripped out and um, it revealed this wonderful wooden panelling. And at one point during the refurbishment, we did seriously contemplate restoring the wooden panelling and hanging paintings on it. Our director, Nicholas Cullen, was really keen on this. And he really thought it would be wonderful to go back to the, the original fabric of the building. But then when we you could see how damaged the wooden panels were, when we tried to sort of you know, test out different sort of um, varnishes, they all just went loopy and lumpy. So we thought actually it's probably going to be cheaper in the long run just to sort of you know, um, plaster them and paint them. But that's these are the stripped out galleries, just to show you how beautiful they are. Because this brings me on to the next point that about the architect who, we had a you know, competition to find an architect who would lead on the renovation of the galleries. And it went to um, Jamie Fobert um, architects who had done other projects such as Tate St. Ives, Kettle's Yard in Cambridge. 
And his idea was very, very simple. He didn't want to meddle too much with the main building. What his great um, idea was, was to reorientate the building to the north and to create a forecourt. And this is all to do, comes back to these congestion problems I mentioned earlier on. So these are two shots which were taken in June, just before we opened. And you can see how lovely and light and airy and spacious it looks. Um, we had to move the statue of Henry Irving, lots of discussions with the Henry Irving Society, who were very reluctant to have that um, sculpture moved, but we won them round in the end. And we just moved the railings and um, and created this lovely um, forecourt so people can sort of mingle outside the gallery before and after it, before it opens. So, and the other idea was to turn the windows, these three windows here, into three large entrance um, areas. So very successful. And then the whole building was cleaned as well. So given a whole new lease of life. And for those of you who've been to the gallery, if you've looked over this railing, you will see the um, false floor was removed. And there's a lovely new learning center filled with light beneath. So very, very attractive for our school groups who now come in large numbers to the gallery. And then the other, um, in deciding upon you know, the, the external fabric of the building, I think I've got another slide here. Yes, we also looked at the doors. You know, um, they originally were going to be sort of wooden panel doors, but then we thought to counterbalance the, you can see here, the roundels at the top here. These are all of you know, prominent British portraitists, but all men. So we thought to try and readdress the gender imbalance across the collection. We would sort of commission um, prominent woman artist to do something for the exterior. And these are the Tracy Emin doors, which was a really interesting. These were gifted by um, the artist and her um, gallery. Um, and we had a lot of fun working with her on these because originally we asked her to produce these etched panels, um, which we based around women, famous women from British history, from Bodicea through to Margaret Thatcher, or whatever, and beyond. And she started producing you know, sketches of Elizabeth I, Daphne du Maurier, figures she liked in discussion with us. But then in the end, she abandoned that idea altogether and said to us, well, all my work is about myself. So I'm just going to do myself as every woman. So she, so we've got Tracy Emin as every woman on these panels, except for one which is devoted to her mother. There's one which says mum underneath <laughs> it, which is for her mother. But actually, they're very subtle and it's worked rather well. People really like them because you, know, you can either take them or leave them. And when the doors are open, they're just pushed to the side. Um, but it does actually you know, help readdress that gender imbalance. I, um, I mentioned earlier on, and helps you know, you know, give some you know, bring contemporary art into the collection as well. And you will also see here on the first floor, all the shutters were taken down, which emits natural light. And we've been able to control the natural light using UV filters and scrims, so we can show works on paper in these north facing galleries as well. Um, so just to mention about the, um, the redisplay of the collection, moving on to that, um, we had to close in 2020. Now, you might remember that was, of course, when the COVID pandemic, that COVID broke out. So we were going to close in June 2023. Um, everything had shut down in March. So everything was forced to close in March 2020. But we stuck to our plan and started the decant of the collection in June that year. Now, when I say the decant, everything on display, there were 800 portraits on display in the gallery. Every one of them had to be taken off the walls for the building work to begin and put into store. There were some really large pictures. One of the largest works in our collection is John Lavery's um, massive painting, The Royal Family of George V. And you can see here some shots of it being taken down from display and then rolled up, taken out of its frame, out of its stretcher and rolled up. And this was during the pandemic. So all the art handlers had to have, you know, the COVID protection, the masks. It was quite a logistical nightmare 
organizing that with all the COVID regulations and distancing. They all had to, I didn't know two meters apart from each other here, but they all had to maintain social distancing. So it was quite an operation. And that went on from June all the way through to September. And that's when Gilbert Ash, the building contractors moved on site and the sort of the heavy building work um, began. And then we opened in June 2023. We were scheduled to open in spring 23. So we're only really a couple of months behind schedule, which is quite astonishing considering all the disruption of the intervening years. And this is a shot of the new entrance hall. And um, just to see how, you know, spacious it is by comparison i'm not sure how many of you have been to the new mpg mm -hmm. but you well, when you go in it's a completely different experience isn't it um and there's lovely use of materials the concrete floor and yet the mosaic these mo mosaic strips which really picks up the mosaic um mpg um emblem on the east side and then the um we worked with an interpretation designer called nissan richards who worked with the, the curators on the redisplay of the collection. And we always felt we wanted people to encounter portraits the moment they entered the gallery. This, this, this space is very difficult to show paintings because of the environmental conditions. You know, the doors always opening and closing. So you get these you know, fluctuations in temperature, but sculpture, marble, um, bronze, perfectly suitable for the space. So in consultation with the interpretation designers, we devised this sculpture island, just made up of portraits from different historical periods. So you'll recognize people like Nelson Mandela, Rubiliac, Sybil Thorndike, um, as well as a contemporary piece by called Reaching Out by an artist called Thomas Price of the woman on her mobile phone. So putting the visitor in the um, picture as well. Um, so all very subtle and lovely travertine marble um, on the walls as well. So very sort of calming space as you enter um, the building. And that was the idea, this sort of, sort of calm, light-filled entrance. There's a bookshop just going off onto the left-hand side. We didn't want the shop to be the first thing people encountered. That seemed a little bit vulgar. Um, but you know, the idea is you encounter art, because you're here to actually have a um, sort of new learning, educational, as well as an enjoyable um, experience. So moving on to the rehang of the collection. Now we worked on the rehang from 2015 onwards, it went through various um, iterations. Each time we submitted one of our applications to the National Heritage Lottery um, Fund, but each time it came simpler and simpler as we went along. We started off by brainstorming the collection and trying to wrap some large themes around it. These were themes such as Britain and the world, um, society and identity, power and resistance, portraits and portrait making, just make sure every single room sort of tapped into one of these um, themes. And then we also started plotting the chronological journey, but also coming up with themes that sat within that. So this opening room is actually two rooms. One of them is about sort of new portraiture, early British portraiture, and then introducing the Plantagenets and then the beginnings of the Tudor dynasty. And the one beyond that, beyond that is the Tudor um, court. And we, to help visitors, we came up with this idea of having star and discovery portraits. So we'd single out two portraits within any room for special interpretation uh, where visitors could engage with them in a deeper way. So this large portrait you see here was going to be one of our discovery portraits. In the end, we sort of abandoned that idea. It's still there, but it's invisible. We just have this lovely aesthetic experience, but it's slightly underpinned by this idea of star and discovery. This work here doesn't belong to the MPG. It's one of the loans in we brought in to help the narrative. So this is a portrait by a Dutch artist called Vavik or someone of uh, Margaret Beaufort, who was the mother of Henry VII. So you could say that she was the founder of the Tudor dynasty. And you can see to her left, you have the first work, the earliest work in our collection, which is the portrait of Henry VII. So that was going to be the star portrait. 
and the discovery next to it. But we've put them in these big frames just to give them sort of you know, extra um, presence. Then you will see as you look behind the interpretation, how we establish this hierarchy of interpretation. You have the introductory text, then these smaller section introductions. So the Tudor galleries are all laid out thematically. There's a theme of you know, the Reformation, um, colonialism expansion, um, queenship, the six wives of Henry VIII, the ideal courtier, always laid out very, very clearly within the space. And yet the whole thing is unified through this lovely use of wool fabric. So for the top floor, we decided to use um, wool linings. And we use these Gainsborough wool linings, wool, wool, wool fabric, um, in these lovely, deep, saturated um, colours. This one, if you, if you remember the old Tudor galleries, they were a lovely grey colour, which we were going to keep. But then um, the director and I and another colleague went to Paris. We went around the Louvre and we saw this colour on one of their walls. We thought, oh, that's really lovely. Let's pinch that and use that for the Tudor galleries. I think you'll agree, it works beautifully, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so these are the, this is the thinking, just give you an idea of the thinking behind the redisplay. So when we were working on it with Nissan Richards, um, we had to do lots of, of designs. These would be sort of, you know, um, layouts, these axiometrics, um, these renditions. And the designers were, they just loved doing these sort of computer-aided designs. Um, and they actually thought we would follow these down to the letter. They were obsessed with their datum and this kind of thing. But in fact, when we did come to hang in the gallery, we did slightly put them to the side and just go for the experience of being in the room itself. But this is quite an interesting idea about our thinking because this gallery is on the top floor and you can probably see there are these one, two, three enfilades going off from it. And before we closed, we had a divider along the middle, which didn't look very satisfactory from an architectural point of view. So we thought we wanted to get rid of that, have a long gallery, but also flag up. You're dealing with a period of time on this top floor that goes from the early Stuarts all the way through to the Georgians. So we came up with this scheme on this wall. This wall would really tell the story of the United Kingdom, how the difference of kingdoms came together through various acts of union. So starting with James I of England, six of Scotland, moving through to Queen Anne and the act of union with Scotland, and then George III and the union with um, Ireland. That would be one narrative along the um, east wall. And then on the opposite wall, we wanted to tell the story of the development of the English language. So starting with Shakespeare and then moving through Samuel Johnson, the first English dictionary. And then uh, to, to, as a counter narrative, telling stories of resistance. So you know, the persistence of you know, Scots and Gaelic and resistance to the idea of the union. So the end wall is all about um, Britain's relationship with um, Ireland. So it's quite an ingenious way of devising this particular um, space. And then just to show you the enfilades, so all the three enfilades were color coded in a different way. Again, so visitors could sort of orientate with themselves within the space. So um, on the left, this is um, on the south side, the green enfilade, and this tells the story of the Stuarts. So this is the Stuart um, court. You'll see the Somerset House Conference, Charles I. Um, Elizabeth Bohemia. Um, so all those, all the rooms on that particular enfilade are in different shades of green. The middle one, the different shades of red. This is our gallery about um, scientific quarry and art um, from 1660 to 1760, with the wonderful sort of um, um, Colly Kibber um, polychrome sculpture looking through to um, Queen Anne. It just helps you with the orientation, and then going on. Um, at a different axis from north to south, cutting across the yeah. east to west flow of the galleries, we introduced these galleries about portrait making. So the whole strand of these throughout the gallery, where we tell the story about different types of portraits and how they were made. So this is one of the um, Mr. Richard's um, renderings. This shows the miniature gallery. You can see it's color coded green, looking north towards the print gallery. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to have these immersive or interactive spaces where people could actually learn about different types of portraiture. So here you can learn all about portraits, how they were made, the pigments, the materials, their um, function in society, whether they were sort of you know, intimate gifts, love tokens, you know, gestures of loyalty. 
um, how they were used from the 16th century all the way through to the 18th century. And then the view through is to the Byron screen, which is made up of, um, it's a decoupage screen made up of you know, cuttings from prints, um, that was, which was owned by Lord Byron. And that's in the printmaking gallery. And it's about, that room is about printmaking and, and the popularization of portraiture through different forms of printmaking. So those, and you can see here through this sort of you know, cross section, you can see the green enfilade, the red one, and the blue in the distance. So very um, clear. And then when you go into the Devine galleries at the very end, something crazy happens. You get these wonderful juxtapositions of colour. And this was inspired by a gallery in Copenhagen called the Forzalden Museum after the sculpture, where you have these sort of you know, abrupt juxtapositions of colour. But we went one further in using this very daring orange. So here you're standing in the blue gallery, which is the monarchy in crisis, looking through to the industrial revolution technological innovations, you portraits of Richard Arkwright, or William Herschel looking far into space. The Green Gallery is given over to the Romantics, and then you have the Society Portrait Gallery at the end. But when these linings were put in place, lots of people were really shocked by the orange gallery. People said it looked like Heinz tomato soup. <laughs> and um, is it, should we tone it down? And then we actually thought, actually, it's such a gorgeous color. Mm -hmm. And because the theme of the gallery was the industrial revolution, I felt actually it really evoked the idea of fiery furnaces. So we decided to stick with it. And it's been a great success. People love that gallery because it really sort of sets everything um, ablaze. And then you have this wonderful view through to the end gallery, which we often use for entertainment. I just wanted to show you the end wall because yes. to flag up something else, while we were hanging the gallery and doing all the planning for the new displays, we were also working on our most ambitious acquisition campaign ever. And that was the campaign to acquire Joshua Reynolds's extraordinary portrait of Mai for the National Collection. Mm -hmm. Um, now, this was um, on offer. It had been um, export stopped and its value had been confirmed at 50 million. Mm -hmm. So it was a really big ask, way beyond anything we could um, afford or fundraise for. But we started as sort of you know, talking to donors and we managed to secure funding from the Art Fund, the Memorial Fund, from various um, private sort of bodies and individuals. And um, in the end, the, we acquired it jointly with the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, paying you know, 25,000 each. So it's a joint acquisition. It's a new model for acquisitions, um, which makes it much easier for museums, which you know, will find it really difficult to raise funds in this day and age to acquire um, key works by British artists. This is a really important painting because Omai oh was the one of the first Polynesian visitors to Britain. And this is one of the first large scale positive representations of a non-European in British art. And it shows my, in this sort of new other hybrid dress in this ex you know, exotic South Seas landscape in the pose of the famous Apollo Belvedere, which is a pose usually reserved for senators. So Reynolds has really aggrandized in him, made him as important as the Earl of Butte, who you will see in his regalia standing in exactly the same um, pose. And maybe when this was shown at the Academy in 1776, Reynolds dressed him in this very simple white dress to show this idea of you know, people from a, um, the other side of the world, perhaps coming from a simpler, less civilized um, na nation, but perhaps being morally superior because of that. So the idea is to show me sort of civilized, but perhaps you know, um, decadent contemporaries in Britain compared with people from the other side of the, um, the world who would perhaps belong to an older society, um, a little more primitive, but in some ways um, morally superior. So these are the, the questions Reynolds might've been asking through that portrait. And we also hung it next to Reynolds's portrait of Joseph Banks, who was Mai's mentor when he came to um, Britain. Mai only stayed in the country a couple of years. He returned on Captain Cook's third voyage and died shortly after his return to the Society Islands, which is very sad, he was barely 30. Um, remembered probably more in this country than he was um, in Polynesia because of the impact and the great impression he made on people he met. He was great hit with the ladies, people loved him, people wrote about him, made plays. 
um, you know, he was a real um, celebrity. And this gallery is all about celebrity. So it shows key people in British society. You've got Pitt, you've got Fox, you've got Nelson, Lady um, Hamilton, Lord Liverpool, lovely one of um, um, Lady Burdett at the top right. When this painting goes to Getty, we're going to move her to the center um, position. When we hung this, a lot of people said, you've got a gap at the top. And I often say to people, do you like it bare or would you rather, I mean, having the gap draws attention to the portrait of my, or do you feel there's something should go at the top? That's something people often um, ask. Anyway, so moving on to the, um, what's that we, we now call the second floor, I still call the first floor. So when you go down, you go ahead in time. And these galleries are given over to British portraiture from the Victorians through to the end of the Second World War. Now, do you remember that slide I showed earlier on at the beginning of the talk, the Statesman's Gallery? This is what the Statesman's Gallery looks like now. It's completely different sort of new um, look and feel. And the big change has been opening up the windows. So you'll see this long vista up to one of the most famous portraits in our collection, which is Laura Knight's self-portrait with a nude um, model at the end, beautifully displayed on a grey silk screen. Um, this is, um, you'll see behind it, we've got a slightly open window, and then lights buzzing in from the north as well. The main spine, which was the Statesman's Gallery, is now really a walk through time. So you start off with the Victorians here, and you come round to the 20th century here. That shows how portraiture has evolved during that you know, long period. And then we also designed it quite cleverly so the portraits in the spine would speak to the themes of the adjacent rooms. So here you've got Gladstone, you've got um, Henry and Millicent Fawcett, this speaks to Florence Nightingale, that speaks to the theme of Victorian pioneers. You've got right, Conrad and Kipling further up, speaks to the theme of you know, empire and resistance. Um, here you've got um, Beaverbrook, Neville Chamberlain, that speaks to the theme of the Second World War. And at the top, you've got you know, the famous Orpen Churchill Dardanelles um, portrait, speaks to the theme of the First World War. So all the portraits are sort of going to lead you in to the adjacent um, walls, the rooms. And you can see these are all these on the on the the um, second floor, first floor, we don't have wall linings, but everything's been painted. We were given um, Farrow and Book Ball, the paint company, funded the paintwork um, here. And so we've got these lovely sort of subtle um, greys, which gives it a much lighter feel. In fact, we rather regret accepting their sponsorship because Farrow and Ball colours stain quite easily. So we've faced a little problem about this sort of patches on the walls, but we're looking at that um, now. Then just to show you some other, this is um, the um, underneath that gallery, Uniting Nations, just to show you the walls here um, and the windows with the scrims and the light coming through. Now it has a much lighter um, feel. This gallery is called Challenging the Establishment. So it's about cosmopolitanism, non-British artists working in Britain like Tissot, um, Sargent, um, we've introduced you know, people who challenge the establishment like Oscar Wilde, you've got the suffragettes here, the Bloomsbury group. So again, it's sort of you know, interweaving different um, themes. But again, you, know, you see the lovely new display cases which have been designed by Nissen Richards, the plinths on the sculpture islands, and using different marbles to give texture and variety to the displays. So it all feels so much more harmonious and part of um, um, a, you know, a holistic whole. Um, this is just one of the Nissen Richards um, renditions of this gallery space to show how you know, we were working it out. And you might notice the lavery painting at the end, because at one point, because you have to remember that that wall was originally blocked out, you know, there's a, there's a blind window behind. And we thought, oh, maybe we should keep that and show the large lavery painting there. And Jamie Fobert wasn't very happy with this. And he was quite right. He kept saying, look, you've got to have all the windows on the north side open. So find another place for that picture. So we did, we moved it, we found another slot for it. And I think I'm very glad we did because it actually makes it a little bit heavy having it at the end. Be interested to know what you um, think. And just moving on, this is the balcony gallery area 
which looks at some new portraiture from 1945 through to the 1990s. And this is, was an expanded space because those of you who've been to the gallery will be aware that the escalator has been slightly sort of you know, blocked out. So which this enabled us to create an expanded area in the balcony gallery on the side so we could incorporate more works into the displays. And for this particular area, we thought we would just, um, rather than do it um, chronologically, we would just have different themes guiding you through the 20th century. So themes such as, you know, sport, um, culture, science um, and technology, um, activism, Northern, Northern Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement. They just guide you through the whole of that space using these different screens, which were also color coded. In fact, in the end, we didn't go for the colors on these screens. We went for a simpler, um, perhaps bolder selection of colors, some of which pick up on the colors used on the top floor, um, some of which are um, different, like including a, a wonderful rich golden yellow. Um, which looks really um, stunning. But these sort of you know, take you through to the East Wing. So again, there's you know, more airy use of the space, lots, lots of light coming in. And with this area here, because we're showing a lot more works on paper, we will have to change and rotate these on a more frequent basis. So if you come to the galleries next year, you will see the photographs have changed. So we, we've got such a rich collection for the 20th century, we can change the themes all the time. And we have a lot of ideas for this particular um, space. This is just a shot of the end wall, which mirrors the wall which has got the Reynolds My portrait on. And this just shows a selection of portraits to show different styles of portraiture in the 20th century. This photograph was taken before the wall was completely hung, hence the um, gaps. But you will recognize wonderful works such as Topolsky's picture of the dancer um, Pandit Ram Kapal, the famous Tom Phillips' portrait of Iris Murdoch. Um, Caroline Hazlitt is one on the far um, left, who was a woman who was an electric, specialized in um, electronics and re revolutionized um, life for women by introducing sort of you know, electrical gadgets into the home. And then you've got people like Stephen Cor um, Hawking, um, Philip Larkin, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the end of it. So in some places, we put this very dense hang so we could get more works on display and just vary the look and feel and pace of the gallery as you go through. This brings us on to the east wing of the gallery. Um, this is a gallery which we used to call the Royal Landing because royal portraits used to be shown there. Before we closed, these lights were boarded out. So again, it was very dark. So the idea was get, you know, open up the space, let in natural light and also the roof lights as well. We opened those and put scrims on. We're still slightly working on this space because there's a lot of light sensitive material we're showing in these galleries. So we're still tweaking it. But just to mention that um, during closure, we had a wonderful sort of you know, um, funding um, opportunity, which came from the Chanel Culture Fund. And this enabled us to actually research works by women in the collection with a view to put them on display. And also we could acquire works by women who are active in the late 20th and, and 21st century. So a lot of these acquisitions were acquired during closure and are on display in this gallery. This is our Chanel gallery and it includes self portraits by women. So some of these portraits in this display, which is lovely, people love this display, because it's just so open and you can really interact and learn more about the sitters this little device here. So just to show um, with interpretation, um, we do allow these different layers. We want people to enjoy the galleries on an aesthetic level, but if they want to learn more, they can actually listen to the, sort of, the audio um, devices or some of the little films where they can actually, some of the digital screens where you can learn more and a lot more information comes up which, without disrupting the nice sort of, you know, look and feel of the gallery. So for this space, we took and works in the collection, including the famous self portraits by Doris and Anna Zinkhuizen. Um, this is our silver panicast, and so you know, introduced them with new acquisitions, such as you know, this, um, a portrait by a um, Lion Cosman, who used to live in Hampstead, who I knew quite quite well. This is Charlotte Berman, um, a contemporary artist called Izzy Wood, who did extraordinary pictures of herself caught up in pretzels and on um, bandages. Um, and then um, the other ones, like Tracy Emin here, 
um, whole new acquisitions in this um, space. Um, so figures from the 20th century through to the present day. Very, very popular with um, our visitors. We'll be changing it next year because of the light sensitive material. Then coming into the East Wing, this is where we come to the present day. And this is where we highlight our recent acquisitions and commissions. So this is this wall here is sort of large scale um, portraits dominated by Chantal Yoff's um, self-portrait with her daughter Esme. You've got David Hockney's um, self-portrait and a work we commissioned just before closure on Tori Latatula's portrait of the writer Zadie Smith. This one was also given to us as a gift for the reopening. It's a self-portrait by an artist from Kashmir who's now based in Britain on Makib Shore. And it's, it's a sort of personal story about a wonderful family heirloom, this Kashmir shawl he was given um, when he came to Britain and how it was destroyed at a fire in his studio in Peckham. So he's bringing together memories of his childhood in Kashmir with London in the background. It's painted with enamel paints, quite an extraordinary um, work. Um, so this gallery is all given over to how we commission portraits today. And then just coming to the end, this is the gallery in the middle, which is another one of our Chanel displays. And these are sort of photographs um, of you know, port photographs of women by women photographers. So again, another new acquisition, Gillian Waring's self-portrait in the guise of Julia Margaret Cameron, you know, the famous Victorian photographer with muses by the um, um by her by her side, put by Maud sort of portraits of um, Kate Blanchett, there's a red grave, hollow figures, Livia Coleman, etc. You will um recognize. And um again, you can see the getting the interpretation, just bits of information about each sitter. But on the other wall, we have these audio points where you can actually listen to interviews with some of the sitters. So these oral histories are being brought into the displays as well. And then finally, on the ground floor, um, when you come in to see the exhibitions, we have a gallery, a, new, a whole new gallery, um, which is like an orientation space. You can walk through it to the lifts and to the core stairs. But we've called this gallery History Makers. And this is just given over to recent acquisitions. And it's really it's just you know, a mixture of portraits of people from different walks of life who've made different kinds of contributions to British culture and society. So dominated by the um, output of Anna Wintour, you've got Peter Blakes of the Glastonbury, um, Michael Evis. Um, then you've got, you know, um, we did a partnership with Sky Arts Portrait of the Year, Lenny Henry's um, portrait, the famous, um, very popular portrait of Ed Sheeran by Colin Davidson, and a wonderful photograph we acquired by Richard Leroy of Michael, oh, I've got his name, the actor. Michael Gambon, who died this year, didn't he? Michael Gambon died this year. That was taken with a camera obscura, which lends at this base of painterly um, field. Dorian Lawrence by um, Thomas Ganter, one of the portrait wall commissions. It's a whole mixture of different people. And this is very popular, getting into this gallery. You always see groups interacting with these portraits. So we certainly feel the whole redisplay has been a success in that you know, it's attracted lots of visitors. We've just reached about the million mark since we opened in June. The whole project cost you know, just over 41 million pounds, which is not bad for a major renovation to the whole building. That seems a lot, 2.5 of which were given to the redisplay of the collection. And we have more works on display than before. I mentioned earlier on when we closed, there were 800 portraits. Now we show about 1,300. Greater sort of you new know, balance. We have you know, nearly 50% of the works on display are of women, as opposed to only 35 before closure. Far more diversity in terms of you know, gender orientation, ethnicity. So it does feel more a gallery for people in British culture today. The display has you know, made the collection seem more um, relevant. We've also put pictures in the context. These thematic presentation have allowed for a more historical contextual um, presentation of um, portraits. And, but you can still learn about the individuals themselves, their biographies. We've also introduced overlooked um, sitters, missing aspects of British history, and also introduce a strand about portrait making. Every single genre of portraiture is represented in the Rehan, not just painting, sculpture, drawings, photographs, prints. We also have life and death masks. 
miniatures and we also had silhouettes when we opened as well so it's really really inclusive and I think finally I think you'll agree that the presentation it's um, bolder and more aesthetically pleasing. And I think that being very well received. We've had wonderful reviews. Nothing's perfect, of course. We still have snagging and there always be areas for improvement. But I think the fact that people keep coming back to the gallery and at the moment it's busier than ever with the Hockney Portraits exhibition, I think that shows that you know, overall it has been a resounding success, if I say so myself. Mm -hmm. At that point, I think I should stop. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them.